So there was a big spoiler, like literally less than two hours after we uh, stopped streaming with me and Christmas Tree Brad. Uh, so we're going to go over these real quick. We'll go deeper into these uh, another time when we have a little bit more time. But I just wanted to talk about a couple of the big things, and the expeditions have been fully covered as well. So we're going to cover the expeditions, uh, some of the spoilers here for Oath of the Gatewatch, and one more really interesting thing from Shadows Over Innistrad. Um, you can see here a Sphinx of the Final Word, 5 blue blue for a 5-5, five five, can't be countered, flying hexproof, instance of series. you control, can't be countered by spells. Or abilities. So that's a pretty impressive card. I'm not sure if it's going to find a constructed home. It's a little pricey. Uh, it's a little hard to wait that long. Maybe out of sideboards in uh, slower deck mirrors. Probably not. But it is a really cool card for older formats like EDH or something of that nature. And it's always cool to have cool cards like that. Uh, let's get to the more interesting stuff here. And the second row is very, very interesting to me. Let's start with Chandra Flamecaller. Four red red for a Planeswalker Chandra. Her starting loyalty is four. Plus one. Put two, three, one elementals with haste in the battlefield. Exile them at the next end step. Zero. Discard all the cards in your hand. Then draw that many. Plus one. And minus X. Uh, Chandra deals X to each creature. So this is a really, really exciting card because it fits in a lot of red decks. It is a going to be a decent curve topper for a lot of aggressive decks, especially if you have ground pressure because the two, three ones will help put on more pressure as they keep going. Uh, the zero ability, uh, essentially windfall plus one, means that you always can get extra cards. First of all, it's card advantage. If you have no hand, it's draw a card for zero. But also, it lets you keep cards in hand you don't want. So if your deck caps out at six, you can keep all the extra lands and turn them into more cards every turn. And the minus X lets her protect herself as well as sort of answer threats. She can fit into aggressive big red decks, red decks that curve up to six, to have her as the top, um, and if there's a lot of ground creatures, the plus one ability does quite a bit. The zero can get you out of a situation where you have dead cards or need more different cards or need answers. And the minus ability is not as common in the aggressive decks, but she also fits into control decks, where her plus one's not quite as good because those creatures go away within the turn. It's, it's not a protecting ability, but her other two abilities are strong enough. Like, this is an unusual Planeswalker, because usually for a Planeswalker, you're first two abilities are the two important ones and the ultimate's not. And in this case, I feel like in most decks, the zero ability, the windfall ability, and the um, sort of board wipe are the two primary abilities for her. Uh, I think she'll fit into most mid-range decks. They can run her. It's a reason to play red, which is nice. Um, I think it's a little bit worse than Jeskai, just because Jeskai has a lot of flyers. Um, with the Mantis Rider and dragons and stuff, you see kind of that build often and the three ones don't play well with that, but if you're playing guys that get in on the ground, adding two more three ones that need to be blocked is a big plus. Next is Kozlik's Return, which I think is a really cool card. It's a two and a red for a Devoid Instant, so it's colorless technically. It deals two damage to each creature. That, full stop, is a good ability. An Instant Speed Pyroclasm is strong. Uh, being Devoid is relevant. It gets around pro-red creatures and still kills them, because even though it has a mountain symbol in the top, it doesn't count as a red spell. And the last part is kind of kooky, and it's the reason this card's a mythic instead of a rare or uncommon. Whenever you cast an Eldrazi creature spell with converted mana cost 7 or greater, you may exile Kozlik's Return from your graveyard. If you do, it deals 5 damage to each creature. Um, there's possibility that this will be played in modern. It competes with Pyroclasm, which costs 2, which is a big game, and Volcanic Fallout, which is uncounterable. But being an instant, being the void, and add the possibility of coming back and clearing for five are all big games as well. Uh, this will definitely see play in standard. Just based off of the first ability and off the second ability, it'll be even more powerful. Next we come to what I think is the most exciting card, at least for uh, Oath of the Gate watch, Nissa Voice of Zendikar. And for one green green, you get a three loyalty planeswalker with a plus one and a minus two. So this kind of plays out a little bit like Liliana. Uh, of the Veil, which is definitely one of the strongest Planeswalkers and, in my opinion, the strongest three-mana Planeswalker. Now, her plus one ability is make an O-1 plant creature token. So she sort of protects herself. She creates chump blockers. Her minus two ability is put a 1-1 counter on each creature you control. 
which plays pretty well with the plus one ability, assuming that it is sort of unmolested and you can keep using it. Which is a little ambitious, but imagine in a modern deck or another deck, elf, right? Uh, Arbor elf into Nyssa, right? Make a token. Now I have two creatures, and then next turn you can play uh, add a token. That's kind of a, a modern situation where you have a noble hierarch into Nyssa or something like that. Which I'll think well, will go well. I think she'll fit into green X kind of um, small guy decks. Now, her minus seven is you draw, or you gain X life and draw X cards where X is number of lands you control. So she has kind of the, the land tie in because she's a druid and all that kind of stuff. But more importantly, her first two abilities are very good. And, and then the third ability is solid. It's just you're not going to get to use it that often. But when you do, it'll be powerful. You will draw anywhere between um, five to ten cards and gain that much life as well. It's, it's going to set you up to be able to use the cards you draw, which I like. It's not just drawing a bunch of cards. It's drawing cards and time, which is a good pairing. But going back to the first two abilities, um, she plays well in aggressive decks. She plays well in mid-range decks. If you can take advantage of the minus two, she fits in the deck pretty well. The problem is you don't want a three-mana Planeswalker that makes a zero one every turn, and then after a certain amount of turns, hypothetically, gets to draw you more cards. You would be better off just running a... Uh, um, Oh, uh, what is it, the Eldrazi card that makes uh, zero ones that sacrifice for mana? Because just adding the plus ones is, or sorry, making zero ones every turn is just not good enough. If you have the ability to pair that with needing counters on your creatures and needing a strong army, kind of an army in a can field, then Nissa starts to shine, right? Imagine in standard, turn three Nissa, make a guy, turn four Gideon, make a guy from each, and then. You know, turn five, you can sacrifice both, give all your guys plus one, plus one counters, and then you keep your Nyssa, right? She's at uh, one loyalty, or sorry, two loyalty. And then you have a Gideon token, and it has a one, one counter and a Gideon emblem as well. So that's a pretty powerful t uh, turn five. That's turn five. Um, you have two, two, threes, and a four, four. That's pretty exciting. And a Nyssa, and an emblem. So I think that she's definitely the breakout card. She's the card to kind of work around being cheap and potentially powerful. But other powerful cards are World Breaker. So six green for a five seven Devoid. When you cast World Breaker, exile target artifact, enchantment, or land. Reach. Two, diamond, uh, sacrifice a land, return World Breaker from your graveyard to your hand. So it's a bigger, stronger, better blocking acidic slime that returns. This is the kind of card I'm excited to play in green ramp decks. You can play it over and over. Every time it dies, you're getting something rid of from your opponent. Uh, at the very worst, it's symmetrical and you're exiling their lands while sacrificing your lands. At the very best, it's getting rid of important artifacts or enchantments or important lands for their um, strategy. All right, we've already talked about these cards. We see uh, the dual land set here at Uncommon. I think it's the allied colors is what we have shown. Yeah, we have the allied colors shown. So that's a pretty strong indication that two colors is going to be supported. And then we've got stuff like Corrupted Crossroads, which is tap for a colorless. Or tap pay one life, add an E-man. Oh, sorry, this is the Corrupted Crossroads is the rare, not the uncommon one. Or the common one. This is the rare one. Tap add a colorless to your mana pool. So for your Eldrazi spells, tap pay one, add one mana of any color to your mana pool you may spin this mana only to cast a spell with the void. So very powerful. Um, probably only really good in this strategy, or specifically this block with the void. Uh, I think that they can push lands that are very strong like this and ally encampment because they only fit within a very narrow band. So I think that's a cool design space that they're using for sure. Crumbling Vestige was the one I wanted to talk about. Um, Crumbling Vestige and Holdout Settlement are very, very exciting lands. Crumbling Vestige enters the battlefield tapped. When it enters the battlefield tapped, add one mana of any color to your mana pool, and it taps for colors. This is an awesome land. Like, it looks a little tricky, and it is a little tricky, but the fact of the matter is, with this at common, it can let you play a lot of stuff. Um, you have to be careful with the sequencing. You have to be smart with your lands, because if you need a certain color, this only provides that colored source one time, and that's when it enters the battlefield, and it taps to produce a land. But... There are a lot of kind of really cool combo pieces to look at it. There's a lot of ways to uh, have stuff blink in and out. 
and the fact that it creates a mana before tapping when it blinks in and out might create some interesting situations. I think that Crumbling Vestige yeah, could be a really cool future combo piece. Holdout Settlement is, I think, sort of a mainstay for support for the five color land deck, which we didn't have strong enough in um, Battle for Zendikar, but Oath of the Gate Watch looks to shore that up. It taps for a colorless. It's great. Tap, tap an untapped creature, add one mana of any color. So having a lot of small creatures goes a long way. Scion, small green creatures, to kind of fill your curve out any way you want. I think this will help the ally deck and help other five color decks. I think it'll be a key piece in making that work well. Um, we see another one of the uh, two color uncommon. So the fact that they're uncommon will make it a lot harder to build a splashy deck, right? These aren't common tap lands, they're uncommon. I'm also a little bit down on them, been that they, they don't like give you a lie or have another small effect. We're really used to these having small effects, and these don't, um, which feels a little weird at this point, honestly. Uh, they might have tried it with the life gain and realized that, or, or with another effect and realized the effects were too strong, so they just took them off. But, you know. Needle Spire is our red white man land, or creature land. It taps for a red white, enters the battlefield tapped. Pay two red white. It becomes a 2 1 red white elemental creature with double strike. It's still land. Powerful. You have to be careful. Um, we have very powerful ramp spells right now. The one that we can delve and give plus six plus six is one that comes to mind immediately, but other things as well. So they're being careful with the double strike because it's on a source that's unanswerable for uh, sorceries. So this is basically like a 2 1 red white elemental creature with double strike that has protection from sorceries. So that kind of protection means that they have to be a lot more careful than they normally would. It does seem a little bit expensive. I was hoping for this ability at one red white, but we'll see how it does there. Another exciting land. I, I do like how there's a lot of exciting lands in this set. Seagate Ruins. Add colorless to your mana pool. So we have another card that goes with Mirror Pool and Seagate Ruins here are producing mana and like Crumbling Vestige. These are producing colorless mana that we can use effectively in our decks. Um, one point on Crumbling Vestige is this is actually a standard playable land because you can play it on the turn where you need a color in your Light Splash to Void deck to get the color you need and then later it provides the colorless you want. Um, but Seagate Ruins, two colors, draw a card, activate this ability only if you have no cards in hand. I expect this to be another card that might see quite a bit of play, just drawing a card for just two and a colors off a of land is very powerful and you can repeatedly use this effect. It's an effect that can be used in stuff like Dredge, although I think this is a little expensive for Dredge, but that's kind of the direction that you can look to to get those kind of effects. We have Tranquil Expanse, uh, the blue-black one. We have an Unknown Shores reprint, which also isn't particularly exciting. Um, it does go back to showing that they are supporting more colors, though, and I think that that's a big gain uh, because it adds a colorless, or tap to add a colorless, or one tap, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So this is another card that's kind of... Um, adding a lot of credence to the five color deck. So I think the five color deck is gonna gain a lot. Green was the worst color in Battle for Zendikar, and that was because five color was not supported as well as it needed to be, and because some of the cards just didn't have a good theme in. But the five color is looking to be supported at least on the land side. So that's exciting right there. Um, I think this is most, not all of the mythics, but a good handful of the mythics. We currently have one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight of the mythics spoiled. Nine, sorry, mirror pull. Eh. Nine of the mythics spoiled. So we only, I think, have the white and the green. I think we have two of each. So like we have two green ones, two red ones. Uh, there's one more black one. We have two blue ones and one some colorless ones. So those are the mythics. The other thing I'm gonna look at real quick was expeditions. Me and Brad were on it for ancient tomb. Not what we we for shown ancient tomb. What were we right on? They have ancient tomb. They have the filter lands, the fetch lands, the battle lands, Eye of Ugin, which we said would probably be in there. Also, it looks super cool. Dust Ball, which I didn't think about, but man, that's really cool. Um, to go with Dust Ball as well, we also see uh, Forbidden Orchard, but... Mana Confluence, which I think looks really, really good. Let's get down to the good ones. 
Strip Mine, and Wasteland. So Wasteland, Strip Mine, whoop, 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 Mana Confluence. So all of these aren't necessarily expensive, but they are sort of flavorful. And I don't think there are any that are out of flavor for the most part. I think the most awkward one for this set um, is definitely Forbidden Orchard, but they kind of made it work. But the rest of them definitely fit into the Eldrazi theme set. I had this open just so we could see the different cards a little bit better. Uh, and the last thing that I wanted to talk about wasn't this new but really cool looking Geist of Saint Traft. But this symbol here is really important. It's the new dual deck for Shadows over Innistrad. Um, this is an old Innistrad character. And this, viewers, is our new demon buddy. Now, I know a lot of you don't read Japanese. I don't read it either. But what I do read is somebody who translated it for us. Mind Break Demon, 2 Black Black, Demon. Flying Trample, 4-5. Good, but there's probably an upside and downside for this deck. When it enters the battlefield, put the top four cards of your library into your graveyard at the beginning of your upkeep. If you don't have four more card types in your graveyard, lose four life. A lot going on here. I see the downside. If you don't have four or more card types in your graveyard, you lose four life. Remember, when this comes in with Shadows over Innistrad, after the other stuff rotates out, we won't have fetch lands. And because you won't have fetch lands, that will be one land type or one type that's a little harder to get into. Now, this does put four cards in your graveyard, and I think that that's a big bonus. I think that Shadows Under Stride is going to play a lot with the graveyard, and I would not be surprised if this is the only card that cares about a number of different card types in your graveyard. Sort of an inverse Tarmogoyf effect where you're really encouraged to do that. Also, if they're going to play with different card types in your graveyard, there is a small chance that Tarmogoyf could get reprinted, which is really exciting. That's a card that really needs to be reprinted and usually doesn't have space to do that. So um, if you have Tarmogoyfs, still hold them. They will still be worth money forever. They're great cards. Um, but I think Mindbreak Demon shows us that the graveyard's going to matter quite a bit. I don't think that a 2 Black Black for a 4 or 5 Flying Trample is great on its own or like good enough to be a demon that they would consider putting on the front of the dual decks. Usually dual deck cards are a little bit more potent than that for the most part. Um, so expect to see a lot of cool stuff there. I also like how the demon and the cards in the graveyard will play well with things like Oblivion Sower and cards from the block before where they can kind of leech off of that or take cards out of your graveyard. Um, we saw, let me pull this up real quick. One of the cards that I thought was super... Oh, come on now. They have a new layout with the lockwork. Sorry, guys. Um, Kozilek's Return is a card that's played from the graveyard. I do not think this will be the only card that's played from the graveyard, even if it's the only card played from the graveyard in this block. Uh, but the fact that it casts itself automatically, you don't even do anything. It's actually not a cast ability. It's a triggered ability from the graveyard. So when you cast the Eldrazi then in res or the trigger goes on and it exiles itself, or you choose if it exiles or not. If you choose to exile, it does five damage to each creature, just off the bat, and then your spell resolves. So really cool design space we're seeing here between how this demon putting things into your graveyard, caring about different types and all that kind of stuff, and just our first Oath of the Gate watch card, Kozlik's Return. But also look at Chandra right here. This way. Chandra right here, discard all cards in your hand, then draw that many plus one. That's a great ability on its own, but in a graveyard-based theme, or a graveyard-based set, we get a lot more advantage. World Breaker, coming back from your graveyard for two and a colorless, right? We see a lot of different cards here, kind of referencing coming from different spots. Even Kozilek's ability to discard cards can be very relevant. And it's not something we necessarily thought about at first. The fact that Ailee sacrifices your creatures and doesn't exile them is really pointing to this very important graveyard uh, along the way. So that's just something I want to talk about. Um, we'll get more into it as more spoilers come out. Thanks for coming in, guys. Uh, tomorrow we'll be off. Wednesday or Thursday we'll do some streaming. We'll probably stream some... I think actually just go back to uh, 
Battle for Zendikar. I know that the different kinds of cubes and stuff are, but I'm, I'm looking to uh, get a little bit more about eating the, the ground there, getting back to uh, the basics with a Battle for Zendikar draft and talking about signaling and reading signaling. So we'll see you guys for that. Um